dit tu devrais. So welcome. I don't think I am. Okay. <laughs> welcome in Palace. We are very happy to welcome you for this talk of Roger Ballon that we organized together with Stéphane Roy for the exhibition of uh, Roger Ballon in Centrale. So it's for us an opportunity to collaborate with Palace as we also collaborate with Ancien Belgique by, with the concert of uh, The Ant of Tomorrow. It's a great pleasure to introduce you Roger Ballon that you of course all know, very famous photographer that is has constructed a very own universe in photography, but more than that, for the people that show the, saw the exhibition already, he really has his own universe, but not only photography, but also video installations. So for the people that not so, so yet the exhibition, with a ticket from this conference, you can also visit the exhibition later on. I also want to tell you that Roger will sign books after this conference. So enjoy and I give the word to Stéphane Roy and Roger Bellin. Thank you Karine. Welcome everyone. Um, so I'm Stéphane Roy. I, as an artist, as a creator and as a human being, I defend an idea, the art, as something that gives an opportunity to bring people together, to create dialogues, to really give that experience that goes beyond all um, borders of language, cultures, and that is amazing with a photograph that we can relate, you can communicate with people, giving us a, a shared space of sensibility, be able to share emotions, ideas, experiences. Coming from a chaotic past, uh, art kind of saved my life, and I grew up learning about artists and one day as a young student in a, in Paris University Sorbonne I came to discover the work of Roger Bannon and as a young student back then it was also that time that Dion Ford was the brand new band that was all over the world and especially with the video clip I think you're freaky and I realized that that very interesting artist that I was discovering at class at the same time as the director of that amazing video clip was, was just a huge slap in my face. So I came to do more some research, digging into the work of Roger Bannon, until one day I found the courage, very shy to actually write a message to the artist and introducing myself and be like, look, I'm just an aspiring curator and I, I love your work. It, it just, when I see your pictures, it felt like home, exactly where I come from. And I really recognize myself in your work. I recognize myself in the universe you are building up. And I feel connected. I really feel deeply connected. And Roger answered me. And since then, I think now five years, yeah. we started to really correspond, meet every year, a couple of times a year, and started to work together. And I'm very pleased to have the honor to introduce you to Roger Ballon today for this conversation. We are going to start like this. Roger will give a presentation about his own work, and then we are going to have a little moment of conversation in which I will ask some questions and then give a speech to you for your own questions. Then it will be followed by the book signing. Thank you to welcome Roger Pal. Well, thank you, uh, Stefan. It's really a great uh, a pleasure being here and. Thank you, uh, Green. Thank you, Pasquale and Stell and the rest of the uh, people uh, from uh, Central who have made this uh, possible. It's your, all your efforts are really appreciated, and I'm really um, very proud of the exhibition we produced, and um, it's a very uh, memorable event in my uh, career. Okay, so. Um, Let's uh, start with this. I guess you always have to start somewhere. So I guess the best place to start with is uh, trying to define what this uh, word means. Well, let's uh, ask yourself a question. 
think of your own name. Mary, Joe, I don't know, Johan. So if you said to yourself, who is that? What would you say? Could you actually say anything? So we have this concept of core self. We have this uh, concept of we think we know something about who we are, the world around us. But then, if I asked you, who are you, Mary? Who are you, uh, Stephanus? Who are you? Who are you? I bet you'll all stay silent. Am I right or am I wrong? Of course I'm right. <laughs> I've been around a long time. <laughs> anyway, so let's start uh, with a video. Stefan, let's see if we can start with the video. I mean, you may have seen it at the show, but I think it's a good place to start. of my mind that I never knew existed and at the same time created a style that is referred to as Balanesque. I think my photographs will take you to a world that has been for many inaccessible. Animals pervade my spaces. Cats, Dogs, rats, chickens, snakes, and more. Dead and alive, big and small, wild and tame. Wherever you look, there are animals. They appear in places that they hardly belong. You cannot escape the animal. You cannot run away from the animal. The animal is deep inside. We come from the animal. are outsiders. They live on the edge, accept life for what it is, and realize there's nothing they can do to change things. They are at the mercy of the forces they cannot control. They wear no mask. What you see is what you get. My images are meant to straddle the strange line where illusion becomes delusion fact is fiction and where the conscious merges with the unconscious dreams become real the real becomes a dream the dead is alive the alive dead
The interiors I photograph are covered with archaic drawings of faces, mass, and animals. Electric wires and wire coat hangers often bent so that they look like thin faces with arms. My intention is to unite painting, drawing, sculpture, and photography. The starkly minimalistic cells in which most of my photographs were taken contain no windows, no light, nothing but graffiti smudge walls. They are populated by fragmented humans, out of place animals, and broken objects. I thrive in places characterized by chaos and confusion. Chaos pervades over order. It dominates the human condition. There is no direction, no ultimate purpose. Confusion and loneliness reign. My photographs can be seen as an expression of organized chaos. Photography has been a vehicle that has allowed me to reach a point where the only answer to my existential questions is no answer. I've commonly stated that the most profound word in the English language is nothing. I come from nothing, know nothing, and will become nothing. My photographs are likely to outlive me. Perspective talk. So I'll go over important um, points in my career, important uh, publication publications, and the um, images will, will be more or less uh, chronological. Okay, next. Okay, so I know some of you are students, or maybe you're students at a university, and maybe you're students of photography or interested in just in taking pictures. You know, we live in a different world uh, of photography now than, say, um, when I started, which is like 50 years ago. At that time, the image was more sacrosanct, more, more seen as a more valuable piece of information or more uh, something of could contain some more inherent value than, I guess, what we have now where billions and billions of these images are uh, produced every day. And so, you know, if you want to start with photography, you have to get out there and start finding your way. And so the earlier work, you know, is, is the foundation to what you do. And, you know, you got to get out there to try to take the pictures and find your way forward. So this was a picture I took in, in 72. And it has some of the elements that are contained in my pictures, you know, 50 years later. Next. Well, there's one thing that really gives my age away. <laughs> <laughs> Woodstock. So I had a, a major uh, piece in the New York Times in August. And believe it or not, which is another interesting point, just because I come from another generation of photography. So the New York Times called me up because they had seen one of my Woodstock pictures on the internet from the Balaness book. And they said, Mr. Ballin, um, do you have any more of these? I said, well, I doubt it, I don't know. But you see, I've been quite meticulous about keeping all my contact sheets and my negatives. So you can't do that so much with digital. You know, when you did film, you had a film, a roll of film, 
you cut the film, you put it into folders, and then uh, you kept made a contact sheet. And you, if you were uh, somewhat caring about what you did, you filed it away. So I said, well, let me look. And for my, in my own surprise, I was so surprised, you know, in those two and a half rolls of film, those, there were three contact sheets. I had a lot of great pictures from Woodstock. And they did like 10, 12 pictures of my Woodstock pictures. But if I had been doing digital now, over my career, there might be like 100,000 files. Some of them probably would have disappeared. And I wouldn't have ne never been able to find these things. So it is an important point. It really is difficult with all these pictures you take on your phone and your cameras, whatever, to have some control about what you do. But it's something to think about. Next. Dead cat. This was one of the early pictures. You see the animals are starting to come out already. Next. In 19, um, 1973 and 78, I made a five-year trip. It's supposed to be a few months. And then um, it ended up being five years. I hit, hitchhiked from Cairo, Egypt, to Cape Town, South Africa. That's how I got to South Africa in the first place. And then I made an overland trip from Istanbul to New Guinea and then across South America. So I was traveling for five years. And um, I think we're having microphones problems. Anyway, uh, for five uh, years. And then I did my first uh, book called Boyhood. And see the form starting to appear. You'll see in my work, it's very formalistic. And I started to learn about forms here. You see the legs, the leg, the leaves, the legs, and the shoes here. See how the forms come together. Next, see the background here. So again, this is 76, this was in Borneo. But see, I'm, I'm starting to pick up the aesthetic. The aesthetic is, is finding me and I'm finding the aesthetic. Next, here, Yelp. Again, you see the wall and the pictures are a bit funny, they're a bit absurd. And so again, in those early days, I was here 27 years old, the foundation to what I do now was being uh, laid. Indonesia 76. Fire hydrant. You see, um, also, which I didn't put in this series of slides, in 73, I got obsessed with painting for about four or five months. Just four or five months. And then I didn't do anything that related to painting more or less for like 30 years later. But again, it was this short period that I got involved with painting. I think that set the foundation for you in pictures like this. Next. Then a few important things happen. One, after I got back from this trip, I did a PhD in geology. So I like roaming the countryside. I like looking at rocks. I like being with nature. I like contemplating the earth, these sort of things. Well, that was really a good thing. This is one of the, I think, more important things I did in my career, because I found a parallel career. Because you've got to understand, in these times, nobody collected photography, nobody bought photography, and I hated commercial photography. I had no interest in it. I got interested in photography when I was 17 or 18. My mother worked in Magnum. I started one of the first photo galleries in America with people like Cortez and Cartier-Bresson. So by the time I was 17 or 18, I could take good pictures. But I only liked it. I only liked to take pictures on my terms, nobody else's. And then I ended up back in South Africa because I was a geologist. My wife was from South Africa, and I was a bit set apart from the American scene. So I moved back there in 1982, and I've been living in Johannesburg since 1982. Next. So the first project that I, I did in South Africa, which I said to people on many occasions, this was the most important of my projects for a couple of reasons. Next. One, I started to use a square format camera. Two, I started to go inside. Three, I started to use flashes. Four, I found the motifs and the people that I would work with directly or indirectly for the rest of my career. 
So did you see that door? Go back again. Just a, just a little information to this one. She's a place called Hopetown. Guess what they found in Hopetown? They found one of the biggest diamonds in the history of the world called the Hope Diamond. Well, this is what's left the Hopetown. But what was important, you see, sometimes necessity is the mother of inventions, as they say in English. Necessity is the mother of inventions. So if I had lived in Belgium instead of South Africa, this probably would have never happened because you can walk around here and it's gray every day nearly. You don't have to worry about harshness. You don't have to worry about sunlight. In South Africa, it was, it's just the opposite. It's bright light. It's hot, and you sit around in these small places, and, and nobody was on the street. So one day, I had a knock-knock on the door here, and a man came out, and he said in Flemish, or Hans Meneer, what do you want? Uh, can I come in? I like your house. Yeah, I'll come in. Let's have some tea together. So this was the beginning. It happened about 83, then I went inside. I went inside psychologically, and I went inside physically, and 99% of my pictures since then have been inside, in rooms, crowded, dark, dank, chaotic rooms. Next. Next. This is where the wires began. So, this is an important point. Where did everything happen? Well, for me, it happened in the place. It happened in the physical world. See, there was no virtual world. That, that would, I don't know if that word existed in any real way. A virtual reality. There was no virtual reality of any kind. It was getting out there. And I've always told people, you may disagree, but that's fine with me. But, you know, the physical experience has more impact on you, the artist, the creator, the, the person uh, who's trying to transform the world than looking at a computer screen. Next. This was the end of the so-called nostalgic period. This is one of the last pictures. 86 to 94, I was the Plata Land series. This became a, quite a famous series. This was a period of turbulence, chaos, chaos, breakdown in South Africa. And during this time, I photographed a group of marginal white people who couldn't relate to what was going on in the country, were alienated from government, and didn't know their future. So during this time, I, I worked on this project. And when it came out, keep going, uh, it was a real surprise to a lot of people. Things in South Africa, for many whites, weren't what the world thought. They weren't going so well. They weren't feeling powerful. They weren't feeling confident. So some people say, Mr. Ballin, yeah, what do you want? How do you find them? Well, that's no big problem. I'll walk around here and find somebody. Now what? So now you go outside, find somebody. Now what? So what? how did I find this person? Well, I found that first. See, without that, there's no that. So before I saw this man, I saw that in his, from the car, and I saw him sitting there. I introduced myself. I saw that, and I remembered that. See, if they take that away, there's no picture. So the comment is always, uh, Mr. Ballin, what about him? Well, that's okay. I can tell you about him. He has a long story. He worked in a prison in South Africa, and I remember his words. I'll never forget the words. Every time I come home at night, there's blood on my hands.
Next. The whites weren't allowed to live with the blacks, the blacks with the whites. Next. This is a very famous picture. Super famous. I think it's for some, for whatever reason. I have my theories. You can figure out yours. You have to go deep in your own mind to get it right, though. Why is this picture staring at you? Why uh, does people? Why do people never forget it? Why has it become such an important picture? I guess in the history of photography. What's about? What is it telling you? What is it telling you? Telling you something about who you are. Don't worry about them. Think about what they mean to you, how they reflect your identity. Did you hear what I said? Does that make you uneasy? Probably does. Next. Man shaving on a veranda. I had a lot of problems after this book. The right wing didn't like me. The politically correct left wing didn't like me. Nobody liked me there, except for one, one thing, or I can't call him a person. The only person that didn't run from Mr. Ballin here was my dog, Leroy. <laughs> that was it in 1995. Persona non grata. Thank you, next. Well, Outland. So, a very important river, or fault line, as they say in geology, happened about 95. I got tired of running around the countryside. It was a bit impractical. A bit impractical. I had two twins, a boy and a girl, running around in the countryside trying to find pictures. I wasn't getting enough done, and I had other things to do. So beginning in 95 to now, all my pictures are more or less in Johannesburg. Next. Here's a video from Outland. Chopped you 36 times. What's your knob? Dirk Peters, Johannes Cornelius. Why do you carry an axe around with you? Because it's my weapon. Take them home and let them go. Oh, that's great. Oh, where are you taking photos today? 
Plenty of rooms I'm renting out to the poor people. How's it, Stefanis? What's she doing? I'm drawing. Let me tell you about Roger. The first day I met him, it was because of a lady who took me to him. I draw a few pictures, and from that day I started working for him. Who decides what you draw? Does he tell you what to draw? Or? No, he doesn't tell me what to draw. I draw by myself. I love to draw. I love nothing else but drawing. What are you drawing? <laughs> Life. What is this? Do you know where Stan is? He's probably in his room. Okay, thanks. I killed the walls. Never again. Never again. I killed the ones and never killed. Every day I catch the rats and take them home and let them go. Tomorrow, like every other day for the past 20 years, Stan will get up, catch rats, take them home, let them go. mentioned uh, Box Gallery here in um, Brussels is giving an Outland show, so I'm sure if you're interested in these photographs, uh, the people at Box Gallery would be absolutely delighted if you visited um, the space to see some of these uh, prints. So this is the Outland project from 95 to 2000. Okay, so now I was saying all these pictures from 95 to 2000 are in Johannesburg. They were in people's houses. And for the first um, part of the series, of the 95, from 95 to 97, they were a bit like Plotalon, and then things really started to move in another direction. Next. I started to use wires here. Dejected. Next. Pumping between feet. I finally got myself a macro lens in, in New York City. And uh, this was the first of the pictures I took that I might refer to in some way or another as still lives. Puppy between feet. Next. Cat catcher. <laughs> I always like to tell the story because it's quite interesting. Guess what he does? He's a cat catcher. Do you know what cat catchers do? Probably not. Well, what he does is he goes around and steals people's cats. Sometimes he jumps over fences. Sometimes he gets stray cats. I don't know where else he gets them. Then he collects them in a bag. Sometimes he calls me up and says, Uncle Roger, they refer to me as uncle. Can you take me downtown? But usually I'm busy, but occasionally I picked him up and took him downtown. So what does he do with the cats? Well, he takes them to the witch doctor downtown. 
in the center of Johannesburg and they weigh the cats in the bag. And then he gets paid one per kilogram of cat. What do they do with the cat? Dead. They get the ear, the tail, the foot, the fur, the paws. Then they sell them in the market. See the mouth of the cat and him. Spot, spot, tail, shadow. Next. See the head, the wire, the ear, the paper. Bing, 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 bing. Head below wires. So now what you're getting here is a bit of a theater. Theater of the balanesta, theater of the absurd. So pictures started to change in this period. I was becoming more like a artist. I was sort of transforming the world in my own terms. So this was beginning to happen here. It's quite an important project, a, a very important time. Next. Then came Shadow Chamber. During that time, I found another place, a place that I would spend about four or five years. It was the shadow, I referred to it as a Shadow Chamber building. There were one, two, three floors in a basement. And the building was a building that the mining companies used to house their workers. Johannesburg at one time produced nearly 50% of the world's gold production. So there were a lot of old buildings left around. And, and after the apartheid government fell, people moved into some of these buildings and started to live there. This is a, quite a famous picture. It's called Twirling Wires. People say, Mr. Ballin, do you know the people? Yeah, some of them I've known like 30 years. This man, I took the picture within a, say 10, 15 minutes of knowing him. Then I went away. When I came back, I said, where's the guy? Sorry to tell you, sir. He locked himself to see the building over there. See the building next to the shadow chamber building. He locked himself in there and died of starvation. Next. During 2002 or so, the drawings started to come into the work. You see the drawings. That was about 2002, so it was portraiture and drawings, portraiture and drawings during this period. Next. See the, see the I, 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 see that form? See that form? And let me uh, see how good you really are in English. What is, what is God spelled backwards? That. It's clever, huh? <laughs> really clever. Would you have thought of that? Next. This is 2001. You see the pictures are becoming a little abstract as well. Sculptural in nature in some way. See that form with that form. Next. Hanging pig. This is the outside of the Shadow Chamber building. Next. And this is now 2004. You can see the jump now. The pictures are becoming a little more surrealistic. Before, say three or four, the pictures weren't that surrealistic. Now, beginning at about this time, another ingredient or aesthetic is added to my photographs. So it was about 2004. You see that form with that form, this form here with that form. Next, wall shadows. And then you see the drawing, the painting, the sculpture, and the moment. See, photography is really relevant, most relevant, most successful, in my personal opinion, when there's a strong moment. That's Cartier Bresson's idea. That's the hardest thing to achieve, a permanent moment. So most people, sorry about this, I'm sure you don't, me might not agree with me, I'm not talking about everybody, but most people can't get to the moment. So they take a picture of something and then they write about it. But when the eye sees the picture, it doesn't have any impact on the viewer. So I don't really like reading about pictures. I like being shocked. 
I like walking by and getting a jolt. Otherwise, I just keep walking. I don't care. I don't care. I just keep walking. So that's a hard thing. You've got to find the moment. You got to create the moment. 95% of the time, if the pictures are going to work. I know there are exceptions, so you don't have to make an argument about that. Next. This was the basement of this place. Next. Boarding house. After that, I went to another place. This was a giant warehouse that the mining companies had used to store equipment, to store uh, supplies, to store explosives, this sort of thing. And people moved in there also at the end of the apartheid regime and create little rooms made out of cardboard and wood and all sorts of materials. And I spent like five years in this place. Next. You see, what's the most important thing in the picture? The eye. The white of the eye. Without the eye going white, this picture doesn't work. Then it's tied up to that up there. You see that? You see these things over here? So, you know, don't ask me the question, Mr. Ballin. Are they staged? Every time you book, pick up a camera to your head, your eye, you're staging something. Camera frames so-called reality. So don't think you don't stage. For photograph by its very nature is stage. It's an aspect of transforming reality. But don't tell, ask me about reality either. Because you don't have any idea what reality is. Don't use the word. If you use the word, just know you don't know what you're talking about. Did you hear what I said? If you do, if you do understand reality, go tell me about it. Next. You see that this relationship up here to that. So the boy put his finger in the snake's mouth, right? Guess what happened? My sister Marguerite had to take him to the hospital. Oh, poor boy. Sorry for the boy. Not one person said, sorry for the snake. How would you like to have somebody's finger down your mouth? <laughs> poor, yeah. That's the world we live in, isn't it? That's the world we live in. Lion kills tourists. It's worldwide. Hunter kills 10 lion and one leopard. Isn't he amazing? Next. This was a very, well, this I think represents my aesthetic in so many ways. It's sculpture, drawing, painting, and this, here's the photography. See that with that? That's about the instant. You see that? Freezing the moment. Mimicry. Next. Eulogy. Somebody strangled his, his, chi his pet chicken. Next, sorry, go back. See this guy? That's blood. If that was a color photograph, there'd be blood on the floor. What happened to him? See, in these places, you know, they asked me, oh, Mr. Bellin, how'd you take the pictures to the people like you? I just want to tell you one thing or another. If they don't like you, you're dead in these places. Or you'll get beaten up or you'll lose your cameras. You know, it's not a, like a place of the timid. It's not like uh, people are like living uh, in a very luxurious way. There are a lot of people running from the law. There are a lot of people who came out of institutions, mental institutions. There are a lot of people on the move. People have no money. There's no free care in South Africa. There's no pension of any kind. There's no really reasonable health care. There's no nothing. So when you're hungry, you're hungry. So it doesn't work to be, think that if you go in these places, everybody's waiting to see you. 
that doesn't work so well. Anyway, he tried to steal the guys who ran the place's TV. And this is what happened to him. I don't know what happened to him. Next time I came, he was gone. I don't know if he's dead, he escaped. I don't know. Next. Then up the street was another mission. All the white companies, the institutions, the corporate institutions, gave money to this place run by a missionary. And then he called the police and paid the police to come and destroy the boarding house because he didn't like it up there. He wanted to make get all the money and all the attention. So he paid the police to, to send in the people from the townships. So he went in and destroyed the place. I've been back a few times. And the last time I was back, I saw this guy who ran the other place, the other mission, the other boarding house. He was driving a red Maserati. Tells you something, huh? Next. That's the end of that place. Next. Next. Okay, so we have one more video. You see it. Ballen. I'm a photographic artist living in Johannesburg, South Africa. For the past six years, I've been working on a project, Asylum of the Birds. I'm fascinated by birds. They link the heavens to the earth. On my way to the asylum house, I'll often stop at witch doctor markets scrap yards and pawn shops at various corners of the city in search of odds and ends that I can use in my photographs or provide for those in need. The locations I work in are unsafe, so one has to have a way with people to survive in this business. The asylum of the bird's house is surrounded by squatter camps, mine dumps, and abandoned fields. When I arrive at the asylum and pass through the doors, I enter another universe. A world haunting and complex, bordering on dreams and reality. A place in which birds and other animals mingle with its human inhabitants. Are you yawning? No, 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 no. We go and take some pictures soon. Finish your bath and then we can take some pictures. Okay, see you soon. See you soon. Okay, goodbye, Yanni. We take go to take some pictures soon. Okay. You got to finish your bath first. <laughs> Photographing birds has been a challenge. They move incessantly, get nervous at the click of the camera, and fly in different directions. They do not trust humans, and one cannot fathom what goes through their minds. Give them instructions, or expect them to be interested in being photographed. You don't have to hold them too hard, just soft, soft, soft. It's a nice bird. It's a nice bird. You can look straight this way, that's way. Look straight that way. Hold the bird just a little bit like that. Stay this way. That's perfect. No, perfect. That way. Perfect. Look at me. Turn your head around. Down, down, down. 
Oh, the bird. The bird's moving around too much. Turn his head. Turn his head. Ah, there it goes. 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 See that over there? Yeah. It needs a drawing. I don't like it the way it is. Go try to do drawing. Go ahead. Make a face. Make a face. Make a monkey face. Draw some sort of face. Put some ears and some teeth in it. Big, big teeth. Great. That's looking good. Thanks, John. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's much better now. Much better. Much better. Much better. Yeah, that's fine. We can probably take a shot in a while. It's great. Thanks. Archetypal symbols from the deeper levels of the human subconscious pervade my photographs. This place is untamable. It has its own rules and functions according to its own laws. When I create photographs, I often travel deep into my own interior, a place where dreams and many of my images originate. I see my photographs as mirrors, reflectors, connectors that challenge the mind. So uh, this gives you a bit of an introduction. And so this, this uh, project, which was five and a half years, from about 2009 to eight or something like that to um, 2014, was in a place that I refer to as the Asylum of the Bird's House. And every picture in the series has a bird in it, whether it's a drawing, a real bird, stuffed bird, sculpture bird. Okay, take off. This was the cover to the Asylum of the Birds book. Next. Headless. Next. Memento Mori, see, see the bird, see the bird. See that little girl. As I took the, was about ready to take a picture of this person here, this little girl said, uncle, uncle, just wait, just wait. And she went over to her room and got this uniform and went underneath the bed. This person didn't live much longer. Next. Theater of Apparitions. This is the last series that I'll show you today. Uh, you can see some of these apparition series in the exhibition at Central if you haven't seen them already. But these images were created on window glass, window glass, using the paint, the paint epoxies and other materials on window glass, and then I made a photograph of these drawings on the window glass. Next, this was the cover to the um, apparition book. It's called Waif. Next, Haunted. Next, Black Hole. 
Next. Desperados. Next. <laughs> Muse. Next. Face off. Next. A stare. You see the window here. You see it. You see the window here. This is on a window. Next. Amulet. So what was the goal? What was the goal of this project? The photograph, the invisible. I would ask you the question, do you believe in spirits or ghosts? Well, nobody can deny it, even though you can't prove it one way or the other. You know, since your childhood, you sort of feel that there's a big possibility that there's spirits all over the place. In Africa, everybody believes, it, believes in them. So what was the goal? The goal was to photograph the invisible. So if somebody said to you, photograph a spirit, what would you do? Next. This is the last one today. I always like to, to end with this. Uh, it gives you and me something to reflect about. Okay, that's the skin that you look in the mirror that you see every day that you call Mary or Joe or Sue or whatever your name is. That's the thing that rules. That's back here. This thing here rules you, rules humanity, it rules government, it rules the planet. If you think you're going to change this, you're quite idealistic, aren't you? How are you going to change that? History just keeps repeating itself all the time. So, how do things change on this planet? How do things get better if we even can comprehend what the word means? Well, we have that as the ruler. Thank you. Thank you, Roger, for this presentation. And I will enjoy that opportunity to finish my introduction of earlier by thanking Central and the whole team of Central for opening the door. And a special thank you for Karin Foll uh, to be such a great help and inspiration on this project. And the whole team of Central for all the effort and energy to welcome this big show of Jebel and Irat Central. Um, and talking about location, maybe that would be the first question to ask you, Roger, about the importance of location in your work, because we've seen with your presentation that all your series are ending with a book, <coughs> the book title, it's always about the location, about the space, you started outside and came inside, you found abandoned places, from the boarding houses to the island of the birds, until later, really more recently, with the theater operations, there is still something that you and Margaret found out in the old jail for women in South Africa, that's where it started, to end up recreating those images and experimenting in your own studio, if I'm right. So the importance of location also leads to this, um, to this theater of, of the Balanesque that is right there, presented at Central until March 2020. Let's talk about this, about the theater, about the importance of location in your work, but also about that key word, the theater of the absurd, that comes back in your work. Yeah, look, um, again, when we uh, look at my history, uh, one can't uh, negate the past. So, you know, it's, as you can see from this talk, it was one thing after the next, after the next, and ultimately the location became a place of my mind, a place of transformation. Because if any of you, I guarantee you, I'll put all my money on the line. If any of you went to these same places, you would never create the same photographs. See, that's the problem we have with photography. We look at it as a so-called depiction of the real, because we don't even know what that means. We use the word all the time. But the issue is it's a transformation of the world through the human brain and through a, a mechanism called the camera. And so what you see here, it's a, it's a transformation of uh, the world, so you're seeing a place 
transformed by Roger Bell and based on the dynamics of the place. So, you know, I, all things being equal, I could easily do the same pictures here in Brussels. I could do the same pictures in Moscow. I could do the same pictures in the Congo. Because it's all about the way I transform what's in front of me or put things together. See, that's, that's the essence of things. I, obviously, I've been influenced by the locations. But the locations are just a one step. And then you have to make all the steps. I told you about Sergeant Debron, the man there. So now you're in a room. So now you're in a room. You go back to the place for five years every day. You're in a room, or a couple rooms. What are you doing today? What's next? It's up to my brain to figure that out. If you were in that same room, you would do something else. So let's not believe in the reality of the camera. Another part that is really important in your work is more than just the location, it's also the people. And it was really interesting to see in those videos, and you will see more videos actually at the Expo, at the Expo at Central, about the way you are working with those people. I've got a lot of questions asked at the opening about your way of working from people who didn't see the videos. <coughs> I were really concerned about, are you using those people? Are you using them and just let them after that you did your photographs? But since we know each other, I know that your phone keeps ringing all the time with those people who call you Uncle Roger and you spend years working with them, living with them, bringing them to the doctor even when they need. So how about the people? You walk with them. Or how long does it take to gain the trust, but also the trust of the people, but also the animals to those locations? Well, the, the, the first thing is that nobody, um, you know, I can tell you one thing and maybe doing another. Uh, so, and every person's different and every circumstance is very uh, different. But, you know, I told you this uh, already. You know, you can't work in places like this that the people don't trust you, they don't like you, and, that, and most importantly, that they don't get anything out of it themselves. What do they care about my pictures? Why should they care? So, you know, I have to help them. It's always a two-way street. I remember once, about two years ago, I brought some people from Norway to one of these places. I never would do it again, so the two guys got beaten up, they got all their cameras stolen, and the woman nearly got raped. It didn't happen to me. So they could have easily done that to me, because the cameras I have are worth a lot of money. But they didn't do that. Why? Because if anybody did that, they would be killed. That's why, or beaten up. Because they respected me and they liked me and they benefited from me being there. You know, it's not such a great world out there, really. Everything is attacking everything else. It's a violent world we live in. We pretend it's all lovey-dovey, but underneath it's the violence that rules the planet. Don't forget that, in my opinion. So, you know, they can say I'm an exploiter, yeah, I don't care what they say. I live with myself. And I can go back to these places if they still exist and everybody's happy to see me. It's just that these places make you nervous. The viewer's nervous and whoever writes this stuff is nervous because they couldn't ever deal with a place like this. We often hear that there is a lot of darkness in your, in your photographs, well, there is a lot of light and humor. There is a lot of humor in your photographs. No, I totally agree. I don't know what dark is. So we use this word dark all the time. No, but what's, what do you mean by dark? What is, what is light, a department store? <laughs> a visit to the beach on the Riviera? What do you mean by this term? You see, when people use dark, it's just a part of their mind they're scared of. It's nothing to do with good or bad or evil or something like that. It's what makes you scared and gives you anxiety because you can't deal with that part of your life. And then you blame me for being dark. Yeah, the, fun, the pictures I find quite humorous. The experience is humorous. And I have a lot of fun and enjoy taking pictures. That's why I've been doing it for 52 years. It doesn't depress me. 
the department store depresses me a little bit more, actually. I agree on that. We also observed in your evolution through your career the progressive disappearance of the human figures, and things are becoming more and more abstract. The animals start to be the main subject under the spotlights. Was it something that was really planned, or did it just come naturally to have this disappearance of the human figure in your work? No, you know, you can't just plan these things. They gradually happen, and sometimes they happen quickly. Sometimes it's over a long period of time. So no, nothing, you can't plan it. You can't plan a picture. So when I go take a picture, I have no ideas in my head. I just go and try to make a picture. And I don't plan uh, to make a picture that means this or means that. I just try to make a picture that, that, is some, that I'm proud of and that challenges me personally. I don't know what's going to go, goes on in your head, but it has to challenge me personally. And if it challenges me and I feel it's of a certain standard, then I let the baby out into the world and the baby does what it does. So, you know, uh, you know, the idea of the, of the drawing in the work, this happened way back in, well, it, it, it started actually in the, you saw in the boyhood project gradually, 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 and then I was able to use drawings in the work in a, in a more frequent basis, about 2001 or two. but it took me like 40 years or 30 years or something like this to be able to integrate drawing and photography. I didn't have the capability of doing it, and I didn't have the interest, but it happened over a period of time, and then boom, it happened fast. I think to be the moment to give the speech to you, if there is some question in the audience. I think we have a third, yeah, we have a third mic. Do you already have some question you would like to ask to Roger? For instance, in the asylum of birth, or in one of these places, how long does it take to make one picture? How many texts do you do, and uh, how do you choose them? and? Uh, because for the, for the photography of the twins that I discovered in the book I, I bought last night, there is some on the, on the contact sheets, there was a lot of different pictures. And one, one of them, or two of them, they were laughing, which is a completely different spirit of the, of the picture. So I'm just wondering if you would take one picture a day and, and you, you really work, work, work a lot uh, to get it. Look, the thing is, is, especially with film, you don't know what you get, really. And especially with birds. Can you imagine a bird flying across? The shutter goes up at 500 or 1,000 of a second and goes down. You don't know how you, whether you got it or you didn't get it. So I always have worked with the concept that time is expensive and film is cheap. And you try to take as many pictures as you can until you feel what you think you got it. And sometimes when you think you got it, you didn't get it. And then some of the, and sometimes when you thought you had a bad day, you got the best picture. So this happens on, has happened on many, many occasions. And sometimes the bird flies out the window. And there's no more bird. <laughs> so you have to find another bird. <laughs> or somebody grabs a bird and eats it. I don't. Uh, so you know, there's no uh, answer to this. And you know, um, uh, a six by six camera has. 12 shots on it, and, and the advantage of digital, I've just started using digital in the last two and a half years, I've done only color in the last two and a half years, but the advantage of digital is you can keep taking pictures for a long time, whereas with the film, you know, maybe you started taking the picture at number 10, and two shots later, you have to change the role, and the picture's gone, so, you know, it's, it's hard to say, you know, it's, one of the nice things about film is like a magical process. It's unpredictable. I'm always so excited uh, to get the contract sheet back, which you don't experience the same in a way with a digital camera. It's like a magic. It's a magic box. Uh, question. Did you ever make uh, uh, color photography? Yeah, in the last two and a half years, I've only done color. So Leica camera gave me, when I made that Balaness video, Leica gave me a digital camera to make the video. And during the time I was making the video, I started to make some color pictures. And I couldn't believe it. 
the color pictures in some cases were better than the black and white. It was one of the biggest surprises in my career. And then it offered me a new challenge, a new aesthetic. And so for the last two, two, two and a half years, all my, I've only worked in color. And I'm very happy with these pictures. They're very strong and they're very they're different. And, and they're the same at the same time. And I've progressed in my aesthetic, which is important. We have a question with the gentleman. Yeah. Um, I have a question looking at your work that you showed here. Um, the journey from that first picture of Woodstock, where everybody seems quite happy and joyful, to the last picture where it's kind of grotesque, it seems quite radical in one lifetime. Would you say that moving to South Africa was a major milestone in making that transition to impact your work? And was it an easy one to make? And then building up on that question, the grotesque, is it perhaps maybe you can explain a little bit further this? Well, the, the first thing is everybody looks so happy it doesn't mean they're happy. But Woodstock? I don't know what goes through people's mind. You know, music is like a, a drug, you know. So people, that's why they go to music concerts, because it, it's an ex it could be seen as an, a way to get out of themselves. So it doesn't mean just because they're dancing, they're happy people. So we have to not uh, deal with this issue of happiness and darkness. I told you, you're crossing a line uh, that uh, is a generalization about the way people behave and think. And you're talking about 7 billion people on the planet at the same time. So be careful about what you're saying. This, the second thing is, you know, the issue of the gross task or the issue of darkness as you're trying to uh, bring up well I actually don't know what you're talking about for instance comparing with works of Harmony Corinne and um, with who? Like Harmony Corinne he made the movie Gamo with similar I don't know aesthetics. who that is then it makes harder to continue that I've been asked several times this kind of references about Harmony Corinne. How do you spell it? You know, I've been living in Africa too long, I think. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm happy to drop it and uh, just come back to the first question and the influence on South Africa on your life. Well, there's a lot of people. Uh, look, I've been in South Africa nearly 38 years now. It's had a major influence in my life. I'll be 70 next year, so more than half my life in, in South Africa, and most of my career has been in South Africa. So, you know, it has played a big role. I, d I don't know if I had ended up in Geneva or in Oslo or one of these places. I doubt I would be photographing the way I did. If I ended up in Kinshasa, it might even be more extreme. So I don't know. It's impossible. It's like to say your mother hadn't met your father. What? It's, it's just impossible to talk about a life in a way. It's because, you know, everything has had, some things you think had a major experience, a major impact on you, but there are a lot of things that have a major impact on you that you actually don't, don't know about. What impact did your dream that you had last night have on your, the, your behavior today? You can't answer that. You can't answer that. So there's so many unanswer, answer, unanswers that why you think, why you feel, why you change, what or how these, this, this complex reality that you, that you find yourself and how they interact to create so-called human consciousness, you end up in chaotic thinking. You can't, it's hard to put all the things together. In the book, Balanesque, you know, I tried to put it together and I felt quite privileged, actually, that I was able to do a book like this. So even if you can't get a book published I would suggest, maybe at a certain age in your life, that you try to write your own autobiography and using photos, using poems, you know, just writing, whatever you do, because it's one way of trying to put things together. You know, you could continue writing the book for the rest of your life, but, you know, is an important thing to do in your life at some point to try to figure out how one thing related to the next in some, some way for yourself. Other people may find it inspiring and maybe nobody ever, ever even reads it, but it's a good thing to do. How are you seeing now the fact that, as you said before,
before uh, were shunned. How is that? How are things now? You know, uh, people are quite um, positive towards me now. I'm building a, a Roger Ballin Center for Photographic Arts in South Africa, quite a large, large-ish museum there dealing with um, photography in, in Africa and, and the way linking my aesthetic with African people who photographed in Africa and whatever. So I'm, you know, uh, they see me in a completely different light. And you know, when Plateland was dead, it's like 25 years ago, you know, so most of the people that criticize me are in a retirement homes now. <laughs> and maybe, and maybe they're a little bit disillusioned about um, the way things have gone one way or another, so they, they, they don't know what to say anymore. So they keep, they, they're a little bit reluctant to talk back to me anymore. Do you have a question over there? <laughs> yeah, it was more or less the same <laughs> kind of question. It's like, the end of the apartheid, uh, what it did to your career in terms of photography or daily living? Did you have a drastic change because of the apartheid ended? No. See, I've never been a political photographer, a social photographer. But you are in a way, even if you're Yeah, in a way, but you could also say it's a theater. You could also say it's a... If somebody asked me about Plotteland and Outland, they asked me what was my biggest influence at the time, I said Beckett. So, you know, photography is different. This is what's different in photography, though. You see, photography is about the world out there. You can't run away for it unless you do the picture on a, com in a computer. So you're working in an environment, and everything in an environment, whether you're photographing in a department store or photographing in a slum or in a McDonald's uh, restaurant, and you can see politically, but you can also see it on different levels. And the reason that those pictures, like in Outland, I mean, Box Gallery's just doing a show now. People go in, into the exhibition. I was there last night. Not Hardly anybody knows about apartheid, but and hardly anybody knows uh, about anything about South Africa, but they walk out and they say, these are pictures really affected me. I got a lot of nice um, messages last night from people who saw the pictures and they said they were deeply moved by the photographs. And, and they, they weren't, they were young people, they knew nothing about apartheid. I like to point another evolution in your walk because we have seen a lot of other photographs and some videos but there is an evolution in your work also that from the photograph you started yourself to make videos and I'm not only thinking about the video clip I think you're freaking from the Antwort you start to explore that medium more and more and then you started to even go in full three dimension with installations could you talk a little bit more about this evolution that is related to the actual show at Central? Now this is a very interesting point that Stefan's bringing up Beginning at about seven, eight years ago, I said to myself, well, you know, to make the pictures that I'm making, I have to, I'm sort of making installations. You know, I'm arranging things, I'm finding things, I'm working with people and animals and places through photography. And, you know, isn't it a bit strange or wouldn't it be really interesting instead of just showing pictures on a wall that I try to make installations as well in these exhibitions? And so I started doing this five, six, seven years ago. And it, had a good impact on the viewers because they could physically feel the place. Of, uh, installation is a, is a three-dimensional experience. A video is, has sound to it. So ultimately, I felt that, if you, it, that I should try to um, uh, make exhibitions that have a multi-dimensional approach. And so um, you know, I started making installations, and I continue to do that. And I try to make installations using things from the environment of the installation. So, for example, at Central, the main installation was that the objects were, were found all in, you know, in Brussels. In your favorite place also, in Brussels, in Belgium. Yeah, I was at the, where did I go this morning? To the flea market, where else? Belgium <laughs> <laughs> is a huge fan of the Maroon. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I have to say, you have to be you might be proud of the, the palace, and you might be proud of this, but your flea market, per size, is the best in the world. And I've been to hundreds of flea markets, and it's the only one almost in the world that's open seven days a week, 
and has interesting things. So this is a, I'll come to Brussels just for the flea market. <laughs> More even than the muscles. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you, no matter the quality of the hotel rooms that you can find, Roger, it's always the same. You end up in these hotel rooms, if it's a suite or something a bit less, it's always a result of a flea market everywhere. <laughs> Do you have a question over there, I think? Uh, so you say you don't plan the picture because you can't, but when you direct the people there, like, how do you construct? Do you have like a methodology that you use? So. You, know, you know, taking a picture is like, you say you're like a painter, you know, so you finished a painting, right? Now you finished your painting. Now what next? Now you have a blank canvas to start out with. So you go to make a picture, you use the optics, you work with the, whatever is there, and you make a picture, then you go home, wow, I did a good picture, or I did a bad picture. Now the next day you go back again, so what are you going to do now? You just took the picture the other day. So now you got to start in again. So what do you do? So you got to use your mind, your imagination, and your experience. It's a conscious and subconscious process, creativity. You know, we don't, it's hard to characterize exactly what creativity is, but it's a process of, you know, that, that some of us are, can use in a, in a productive way. And so there's no, uh, no plan. I just have to work step by step, and sometimes there are literally thousands and thousands of steps that get there to get to a point where I say I have a, I have a coherent um, image in front of me that has a deeper meaning. Did you hear what I said? Coherent forms with a deeper meaning. I feel that exists in what's in front of me. Then I pick up the camera and try to take a picture, whether it's with, with a bird or, or a person, or, or no living thing in it, and, and try to take it to that point, take it to the next point through the camera. And it's, a, it's unpredictable in a lot of ways what, what the meaning's going to be. The meaning is in the picture. And the, and, the, and, the, and the meaning in the picture is different than the meaning in the mind. They're two different things. The mind is up here, and the picture's out here. The picture becomes an object in itself that has its own meaning. And it's a, like, a, if it's a good picture, it lives for a long time. And if it's a bad picture, it disappears. That's the nature of art, or used to be the nature of art. I don't, I don't want to get in that argument about what, what art's about anymore. It's just a, a word that has no meaning, I think. It's just expression. Maybe another part uh, that is very important in your process of creation and production, but also with the installation, is the place of Marguerite in your work, your art director. Uh, uh, Stefan's talking about Marguerite Rousseau, who's worked for me for 12 or 13 years, and this has a, been a great um, collaboration. She's unfortunately not here today, but she did a, made a major contribution to the installation and some of the pictures you see at Central. So. You know, so it's, it's been a great collaboration. She's a very creative, intelligent uh, person who's been a real help to me and con contributed immensely to the pictures. And before that, I had a woman called Jenny. Jenny worked for me for like 11 years. And well, you ask me how I survived in some of those places, because they love Jenny. <laughs> they love Jenny. Jenny was exuberant, Jenny was generous, Jenny loved the people, and the people loved Jenny. And they would never, uh, they would never go against Jenny. Jenny was like a mother figure. And so Jenny played a huge role in my success and, you know, in Outland and Shadow Chamber and part of Boarding House. And then when I started working with Marguerite, who was more, less of, a, more of an artist than Jenny, you know, the pictures, you know, I think she contributed uh, to the pictures moving in another direction. Um, a question here. Uh, I'm going to go back to the previous question. Um, and you answered um, about choosing the good picture and a bad picture. That was the last thing I kind of caught. Um, how do you yourself approach this dilemma of choosing um, in those compromised pictures that you make. Let's, say, let's assume you take a couple more pictures of a subject and on one picture the subject laughs, on the other one blinks and then the bird is gone. Um, how do you yourselves 
deal with the dilemma of choosing what is the right picture, the final one? You know, in a way, the picture finds you. That's the whole thing. If it's a really good picture, it just, it's a knockout. It's just no questions. It's always interesting. This is, it's bringing up an interesting point here. You know, I never, in my 50-something years of taking pictures, I've rarely taken two good pictures of the same scene. Almost never. I can't even think of maybe once or twice or three times, and it was like a still life or something. But it almost has never happened. One just seems to go further, and you know it immediately. You just know it immediately. Sometimes you have to blow the picture up, you know, in the old days, you know. But then it's, it really reveals itself as you blow it up. But it's, it's usually not even a question. I think we have time for two more questions. Roger, you make exhibition all over the world. Uh, do the public in the different countries have another relation to your work? I talk about that because of the installation in the Centrale. People told me about the Belgian surrealism and about the link with Ensor and other Belgian artists. Did you feel that? Is that present in your mind? Well, this is a good question. You know, again, you're dealing with a large amount of public who you don't get to know and you don't talk to, and so it's you generally know in some countries it's a it's a more sophisticated uh, culture. Uh, cultures have a much greater history of art or a different history of art um, than other places. So that's why you know countries like uh, Belgium, maybe France, Spain, which have a sort of history of surrealism and interest in art brut and, and Dadaism and, all, and, and theater, you know, the, these type of countries, uh, I think that generally I would say that the people have a, a deeper appreciation of, for, for what I do, a more sophisticated appreciation. Uh, you know, again, there are many, many exceptions. I wouldn't want to be generalizing, you know, because it really is difficult to to know, you know, you have these shows, you come in for a few days and you can't read the newspaper articles. And But, you know, I feel, um, you know, the last, you know, 15 years of, of the work, you know, we've I've gotten beyond this political message that seems to obsess people, you know, these people. So you know, somebody asked the question about the people, well, I stopped doing this about 2002, and then people started to appreciate a lot of the elements in my pictures that they were there before, but they were so obs so um, obsessed with the people. So um, then, the, then it became another so-called world that didn't uh, get get people um, all um, obsessed with this state of, of 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 cultural and economic affairs of the people. And so the the aesthetics of the picture started to play a greater role. And I've always uh, believed, uh, for me. Um, What's crucial is that picture gets in people's mind, no matter whether they're poor, rich, happy, sad, in microseconds. And I always have the um, good example in Africa, because like in Africa, they don't, a lot of people don't know very much about what, me or my photography or even care about it. But I know from my many times in South Africa, sometimes I used to have a, like a metal box until recently that I would put through the x-ray machine, you know, and the, the, the x-ray machine wouldn't register what's in the box. And so then they open the box and they go crazy when they see the pictures. Wow, this is scary. Wow, this is amazing. Wow, this is strong. Where'd you take it? They got all interested. These are like pictures from the asylum of the birds. Some of them are quite abstract. They got in their heads right away. They became excited and almost, almost in a state of, I don't know what, fervor when they see these pictures. And so that tells me a lot about the nature of my pictures. Sometimes a reaction like that is more gratifying than having a professor of art look at the picture. Because you know you got something good when that happens. Um, concerning your uh, work, the journey, um, you, you travel a lot, um, you move continents, 
you've seen places, people, and circumstances not everybody would see. And you knock on doors, you don't know what's behind it. And you seem courageous uh, enough to do that and curious. And what I was wondering, do you have any fears? Look, I think every, most people have the same fears. Some people more paralyzed by the fears. Some people more obsessed with minor fears and major fears. But the fears that drive humanity and, and obsess me and, and, and most uh, things on the planet, animals, are the same stuff all the time. You know, if you basically look at human behavior, it's most of it's related basic to basic instinctual, uh, instinctual states of being, whether it's the need for food, the, uh, the fear of death, sex, you know, power, territory, all these things. So, you know, what, so, you know, we're, we're the, the, the fears basically of, of me and the fears of everybody else are, 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 are the same, you know, what's, you're going to wake up tomorrow with a tumor in your head. Are you going to get, are you going to, what's going to, when are you going to die? Uh, what's going to happen to your family? You know, these are all fears and, and they're animalistic in nature. So we carry, I carry them with me and you carry them with me all the time. And some people are more obsessed with them and, and blank them out and repress them. And other people use them as a basis for being creative. And other people uh, don't know how to deal with it and, and take antidepressants. So, you know, there's a, there's a, so I think this is an important thing to focus on, you know, as you live your life is to just try to blank out this massive media machine that's actually uh, leading you to a pasture that only benefits them. You got to find your own path in your own way and come to terms with it in your own way. And I hate to tell you there's, there's no how-to book that gives you a real formula for doing that, in my opinion. Is there one last question in the audience? You said that you're not political, that you chose many of your series to depict people who are marginalized. Isn't to say that they're marginalized already a political message and to photograph them and show these images around the world a, a very political message? What happens if I took a picture of you? Are you, a, are you a political message? Of course you are. But I took a picture of your mother. She's a political message. So you're all worried about, you see, the, you know, that, uh, you know, the thing is, is just because somebody's uh, poor, it doesn't, and you photograph them, it doesn't mean they're any more or less a political message than photographing the Queen of Belgium. So. Well, I think what he means is that you, you bring things out that normally wouldn't be seen as much. Yeah, they threaten your state of stability. <laughs> they threaten your state of st uh, stability because there's a certain chaotic thing in, going on in those pictures that it doesn't uh, fit with your need to stabilize the world around you or your need to come to terms with, well, put it this way, the pictures uh, remind you that um, it's hard to keep things together. Uh, you might, might want to call that a political message, but it's it's not it's not really it's not it's not really. You see, I always uh, say that these are about this is about the politics of the mind. So you're right in one sense. It's 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 uh, it's it's upsetting the relationship between the repressed state of mind and the conscious state of mind. And so that's where the poli that's where the line is. That's the problem on the planet. That's why you never solve any problems. I told you about that. Because people are, are not capable of, of getting inside and coming to terms with what's inside. 
And if any politician or any businessman says anything of any philosophical truth, he upsets society, people can't handle it. And he gets that, he loses power, loses control. And the media is all over the person. That's the problem. Sorry, I'm not too politically correct, by the way. I don't care anymore. Are you ever shocked? We have a very lost question. Am I shocked? Yeah. Yeah. About what? Shocked. About what? Is there something I'm shocked sometimes that the sun comes up in the morning. <laughs> what happens if it didn't? So, okay, okay this, um, I'm going to ask this because I think the, in Europe, we are not used to see white Africans, Africaners in ghettos. So don't you think that's also like shocking? It's not shocking to me. I'm, I'm walking around this place and I'm shocked by all the muscles in the pots. Yeah, but, but you realize that uh, the European public is not used to see white Africaners in ghettos, no. right? I think, you know, you're thinking about things from 30, 20, 30 years ago. People in Europe aren't interested in that anymore. If I did Plot de Land now, nobody would be interested. I would have a zero response. Why do you say that? Because that it was not an issue of, of interest anymore. Well, while I was fortunate in a sense of my career when I did the book, South Africa was in the headlines, you know, like Trump is now. And everything happened, everything, anything that happened in South Africa was in the headlines, you know. And so I was, it was a, a good, if I, it, it was a, the timing, I'm not saying it was right or wrong, but the timing at the time, that's why the book, one of the reasons, although the pictures were good, one of the reasons the pictures became so talked about is that it was an important news issue. And the media found it an interesting thing that, to be obsessed with. And then they move on, of course. Of course they move on. You know, they can only, people can only handle so much Trump and then they want to watch the football game. Thank you so much for everyone. Maybe it's the way to conclude this uh, really nice talk of today by saying that as an example of what just happened now, that the art of Roger Ballen is something that doesn't leave people unsensitive, that opens for dialogues to many questions, many feelings and emotions. Thank you, Roger. And thank you to the Palace and Central for the opportunity of today. Roger will be present in the Thank you very much, Stefan. A really great pleasure working with you. I appreciate really it. Pleasure. And the very last thing, so Roger will be present in a few minutes to sign books if you're interested. And uh, Roger is a man of a very busy schedule before flying to another opening tonight to another art gallery and uh, uh, with another interview to do as well. So you will be there just for a short few minutes to sign books if you are interested. This one.